done it here yet, but in the past you've often put two running backs on the field at the same time. Just mm -hmm. what's the pros and cons of using a two running back set? Well, the pros are if you have two really good ones, it, it puts a lot of problems on the defense. Um, the other part of it is can one of those running backs play receiver? Can they line up in the slot? And we have, uh, we believe Trey does. Trey does it a lot, especially when we're in empty sets and can be a mismatch from that standpoint. Uh, the cons are you have two running backs in the game at the same time, and if what's your depth at the running back position? How many running backs do you have? Um, you always want to try to keep them fresh. I think Carlos has done a really good job of rotating those guys right now. So um, there's always positives to having two on the field at the same time, but there are some negatives in terms of, you know, if they're both going full speed six, seven plays in a row, and they both need a breather, then you got to take them out. So you know, it's really depending on what your depth is at the running back spot. Has James given you confidence that you feel like you have that level of depth? Maybe yeah, James has. I think James has done a really nice job in the first two games. You know, we, we were excited about him coming into the first two games, but you never know. You know, it's kind of like a, the old adage of players like a, a tea bag. You don't know what you get till you put in hot water. Um, and I think with James, you know, you, you learned that it's, he's, he's a pretty good football player. So um, we're excited about how his growth and how he continues to, to pick up what we're doing um, and what we can put on his shoulders so that that adds to the depth at the running back spot. Uh, front row, Bill Rabinowitz, Columbus Dispatch. Chip, that was the first year that, that on the field they can use the iPads mm -hmm. in the press box. But how much of an advantage is that? What are you able to do with that that you couldn't do in the past? Um, well, people actually did it in the past, but they always were looking at the scoreboard to try to see the replay. Um, it was funny when we were in the NFL, there were people that said they didn't want to do it, but every coach in the NFL was always like this and watching the replay up there. Now you get to run it back. So um, I think it's cleaned some things up. Sometimes it takes to halftime before you can make a – adjustment because um, the guys in the booth are trying to communicate that what they saw because the guys in the booth can obviously see the game better. Um, the guys on the field can feel the game better. Um, so I think it just kind of puts people all on the same page, and I think you can make corrections a lot faster. Was it something where you wondered, why couldn't we do this in the past? Or what was yeah, that? We, you wondered it because they showed the replay in the stadium, but they wouldn't let you have the replay on the sideline. So, um, you know, it's progress. We're all we're – all, uh, you, you can't fight it. You know, we're all moving in, in different directions. At some point in time, they may actually have videos in their helmets. I don't know. But just whatever the rules are, we're going to adapt to them. So. Tim May, front row right, Letterman Row. I like a teabag line. Uh, uh, I, I asked Ryan this one to ask you two, just two quickies. Number one, how important is it to somehow another – Based on what you saw Saturday, with Quinn Ewers leaving the game, uh, Wisconsin losing a starting quarterback, to have a competent backup that you feel real good about, and how do you generate that? And then number two, do you do you feel much better about your offensive line today than you did two weeks ago from the standpoint of how it played in your last game and progress, etc. Two drastically different questions yeah. right there. So, <laughs> I think will, will it, yeah, because they're both on offense, but that's about the only thing I can fish those two together with. Um, the quarterback spot, um, obviously you want to develop depth and you do look around the country and who's lost their quarterbacks and, and or a guy goes down for a time. But the other part of that is, you know, it's not like Will's been here for five years. Will's played football for five years. So it's he needs as many reps as he can in Ohio State's offense. So you're in that fine line of how many reps do we get Will of live game speed in a stadium where it's real. Um, it's the toughest position to play because – you can't practice it the way you play it. What, what I mean by that, and I don't care what level it is, quarterbacks don't get hit in practice, but quarterbacks get hit in games. So it's a different game for a quarterback when it's, when it's live. Um, so to try to balance how many reps does Will need to continue to get better and continue to grow is, you know, we finish our last out-of-conference game here against Marshall and then head into conference play. You know, do we feel like he's got enough under his belt so that when those situations come up in a game that he's experienced it already as an Ohio State player? I know he has as a Kansas State player, but not. Um, but you also need to develop your quarterbacks because, you know, we always say you're a chin strap away from playing. You know, the, if you get your helmet knocked off on the field of play, you're out for at least one play. So someone's got to go in the game. So um, that's a fine line, and you always have to tr continue to try to walk it. Um, but we hope that, you know, I think Devin and Julian um, did a nice job when they were in. Lincoln got three snaps, but it was really late in the game, and that was more handoffs than anything else. But, um, you know, we'll see how that continues to go. But you do have to have two quarterbacks, and, you know, especially when you're going to play such a long season. You know, if, if you're going to play a 16-, 17-game season, at some point in time one of those guys is going to be called upon during a critical time, and you hope that they get enough reps under their belt that they feel comfortable when they go in there. And then, I mean, he, had, he may have three or four more after us, but... Um, 
The offensive line, I think they made um, pretty good strides from game one to game two, more from a communication standpoint and being on the same page. Um, and now adding Donnie back this week, I think, you know, adds a little bit more depth to that position because Austin played really well himself. So I think Austin took full advantage of the reps that he got in the two games that he was in there. So um, we'll continue to monitor that situation. But I was, I was really impressed with how they went from game one to game two. Uh, Andy uh, Anders, uh, Lemon Warriors. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that stood out watching the offense just pre-snap is the motion and the different window dressings you guys do and, and formations. Just what is the importance of that from your from your perspective in, in, in using pre-snap motion? Yeah, I, I think pre-snap motions are two things. Number one, to gain an advantage numerically against the defense. So if you move and they're not moving, you gain one hat from one side to the other side. Uh, and then number two, to discern what they're in. So it, it helps the quarterback from an understanding standpoint. Now, I think all of our motions and shifts have a reason to them. It's just not, hey, let's just do this for this play because it looks cool. Um, so the quarterback knows what he's looking for and what indicators he should get when we do it. So it, it, again, it gives him some information. But also, at times, you're trying to gain a numeric advantage from one side or the other. So if they lined up over here and we bring an extra guy over, if they don't bring an extra guy over, now we have an extra guy into the boundary. So we're trying to. Um, work the advantages from a number standpoint with motions and shifts, but also discern some information about what they're going to do, especially teams that are really good at disguising. Right behind him, Tony Gerdman, Buckeye Huddle. Last week being the improvement week, what was the focus uh, with, with you and Will on uh, what he needed to work on? Yeah, it was different for each player. So we graded every player during the week. Um, each player had a different set of things that they had to work on. You know, Will, there were some real technical things from a fundamental standpoint that if, as we continue to drill and play action pass and demeanor and what his fundamental footwork is going to be on those plays, some of it was just recognizing pre-snap indicators of, you know, where is the free safety and he, is he discerning? Can you discern from where his alignment is what the coverage is going to be pre-snap before we get to post-snap situations? So um, Will continues to grow every day. That's one thing I love about him. He's a lifelong learner. He comes in here every day really hungry about how do I get a little bit better every day. And um, I think last week was a, he, he did improve in, in from Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday in training sessions. Right next door, Pat Murphy, 24-7 Sports. I'm sure you were at least aware of Quinchon before you got here and, and started mm -hmm. working with him. But maybe where has he surprised you as a running back? And, and what have you learned about him? I know it's still early on. Yeah, I had just really watched highlights of him, you know, uh, in terms of what he did at Ole Miss. Um, but he just, how well he sees the field for someone his size, usually, you know, uh, guys that big are a little bit more of a batting ram type player. It, although he has those qualities, he's a tough, physical, hard-nosed guy that will square up a linebacker in a hole and, and pick him up and pass protection. But he's got great feet and vision for someone his size, and it's, um, it's really surprising sometimes when you see how he works his way through a hole or, or what doesn't look like a hole, but he can work himself through it because um, of his vision and his footwork. And I think uh, putting that on somebody that size, a 220-pound plus running back, is, is kind of a rare commodity. Usually that's a little bit smaller guy, but you know he has those qualities. But he's also got a real tough physical real tough physicalness to him that he can really, if you have to, and there isn't a hole there, he can create a hole himself. So. Uh, fourth row right, and Andrew Backstrom, Letterman. Yeah, Chip, we saw some three tight end sets, four tight end set. How is that depth of that tight end room allowing you more flexibility in offense right now? It, it has, you know, and I think it's a credit to those guys in that they, they all playing time here is earned. So, you know, when you say, hey, we're going to run three tight end formations, it's not, well, whatever three tight ends are there. It's it, That conversation comes up in staff meetings because we really believe in those guys and so what they can do. Um, you know, so I think, you know, G's played a lot of football here. Um, Jelani played a little bit last year. You know, I saw him on town. W Will played at Ohio. You know, I think Bennett's done a really nice job himself. So the four of those guys have really earned it, and I think we'll continue to, to work through some of those packages and see what's the best fit for those guys. Right next door, Andrew Gillis, Cleveland.com. Chip, what is Seth McLaughlin brought you guys to the first two games, and, and how valuable is it to have a guy who's played that much football at center? Yeah, hey, that's a great point. I think really stability. Um, you know, kind of he's been there, done that. He learned very quickly. It really just for Seth, it was um, how do we call it and what is our terminology, you know, as opposed to what he did when he was at Alabama. But he, he's seen a lot, um, and he's played in some really, really big games. And so I think the, the other players on the line kind of look to him because they know he has that experience. Um, but I think the stability he's brought and really the, the leadership at the center spot, you know, that guy has to make all the line calls for you and to have someone in there that, that can do that, that has the experience that Seth has, um, has really helped. Uh, deep left, T 
Tim Hall, 97.1 The Fan. Chip, another one about the running backs. What would you say has surprised you or just impressed you the most about Travion's play through two games? Yeah, what impressed me the most about Trayvon is just his work ethic. You know, he, he's a guy that is out there every single day, and he only knows one speed. You know, you never have to talk to Trey about effort. You know, and he's, he's always trying to get better. Like, you watch him and walk through, and it's meticulous with his steps and where his hand placement is, and he's not just going through the motions. So, um, you know, I, I think he's a... a Explosive play waiting to happen, you know, and I've seen those on highlight tapes of what he's done here in the past, and and I think he's close, you know, he's he's really close, and so hopefully, you know, in these next couple of Saturdays, we're going to see him really take one through, not only through the second level, but through the third level, and and go all the way because he has that type of breakaway speed, which I think is kind of rare, you know, he's he's one of the fastest kids on this team and can really really move, so you know, excited to see him take that to the next level. But I love his physicality as he runs. I love what he's done in pass protection for us in our first two games, so um, excited. Excited to see him continue to, to grow this season. All right, Austin Ward, podcast. Chip, when you talk about the, the pre and post snap decision making there for Will, when you guys are in these RPO looks, it seems like he's pretty, it seems like he's in command of that. How much, how frequently is he making the right or correct or optimal decision with the football right now? He's been really good in his decision making process. Um, you know, I always chuckle because some people, I don't know how when I watch tape myself, like, is that an RPO situation or not an RPO situation? Because that could just be a hard ball call. And his job is to hand the ball off. Now, his fake may be that, but he didn't have anybody that was a relief throw for him or wasn't even looking to have a relief throw. But um, he's done a good job in what we've asked him to do. You know, really, we talk to our quarterbacks about being the run game coordinator. And he has to, you know, make the play right. You know, whether it's sometimes it's a check system, you know, we're supposed to go right and there's a lot of guys over there, so we got to go the other way. Um, other times he can he can make it right by throwing off of those guys. So I, he's been really good in his decision making in the run game. Joey Kaufman, Columbus Dispatch. Does Will do anything that makes him effective as a thrower out of some of the play action or RPO stuff? He's been very efficient in those situations. Yeah, I, I think it's a combination. Number one, he's really good fundamentally with it. I, you know, part of it is who are you trying to affect with the fake? Um, you can't fake and hold the ball from everybody, so everybody's going to see it at some point in time. But there's certain people that you're trying to get to bite on the run fake, and, and I think he understands that and is really aware of that. Um, and then number two, I think because we do run the ball well, that that's part of the biggest thing is it, you know you you can be you can have an extensive play action um, game, but if you're not running the ball very well, I don't think they're going to bite on it. You know, um, most defenses need to be lactose intolerant. That means they can't bite the cheese. But if we do a good job running the ball, then we, we think they're going to bite the cheese. So that helps. Uh, Bill Landis, Kings of the North. Chip, um, when you're trying to figure out the, the thing or things that maybe the, the offense does best that you're sort of maybe want to hang your hat on a little bit, how, how often do you feel like you have a pretty good beat on that before the season? And, or how much of like a fact-finding mission does it become in the first couple of games? And then I guess where do you think you are with this particular group? I, I think it's always an ongoing process because your lineup changes as the season goes along. You know, so, I mean, Donnie's an example. Donnie wasn't with us for the first two, but will be with us in this game. You know, so where is our strength um, as we add Donnie to the lineup? You know, so I think that's an ongoing process. You don't ever arrive and say, hey, now I know we are worth this, you know, because that can change drastically, you know, with a, with a sprained ankle or something where you're going to have to adapt and improvise as the week goes on. And then obviously the other thing, the biggest factor in that too is um, what changes is what are you facing defensively? You know, and so is how they how they deploy their eleven drastically different than how the team the week before did. So you know, may say, hey man, you guys really ran the ball well against this team. Yeah, you know, well this team put ten guys in a line of scrimmage and we're gonna take it away, so we have to throw the ball over the top. You know, there's just the sheer numbers deal that you deal with that way. But um, you're always learning because I think your lineup changes subtly and sometimes drastically. Um, you know, as the season goes along, you're gonna be able to adapt to that. Spencer Holbrook, Letterman Row. Chip, when you talk about uh, the tight ends and being able to, to go three and four tight end surfaces, how involved can they be in the passing game out of that? And, and what, what limitations? Well, Bennett had a 55 yarder yeah, for a touchdown, so yeah. I would say somewhat. I'm trying to leave it like the, pro, the, the pros and cons of going into those bigger sets. Yeah. Being able to no, it's, that's a great point. There are pros and cons. You know, the. The more surfaces you build and the tighter they are to the football, then the less you can technically stretch the field. You know, but I still think there are there are plays that can come out of those sets because 
the mindset of the defense when those guys come into the game should be they're going to run the ball. And I would say percentage-wise, we're probably going to run the ball more than we're going to throw the ball in those formations. Um, but there's a give and take there. You know, I think you have to always try to complement it. You know, we may have two or three good runs out of this, but we got to have a play action pass. We got to have a completion. We got to have a shot play out of the, you know, what's our shot play out of this? Um, you know, so it, it's, it's interesting on how defenses, when you look at, like, we think knowing, but we know our personnel. We know knowing our personnel, this is how we would defend it. Then you go to play another team and it's like, wow, I never thought they would do it that way. So here's our answer if they do do it that way. So, so I think you have to be prepared for it because the issue is sometimes you're not going to see tape from other opponents that have presented that. So you don't know how teams line up to these formations because the, in the first three games that they played, they've never seen that formation. That doesn't mean they don't know how to line up. It just means we don't know how they're going to line up to it. They, they certainly do. So sometimes you're going to find that out as the game expresses itself. We've got one, time for one final question. Tim, take us home. This will get us to 100. I know you got a question. Me? Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> if, how, how pleased have you been? Is this a three-parter or a four-parter? No, it's just one. <laughs> okay. Jerry just said one. How pleased have you been with the run game to this point? I mean, are you are you seeing a crisp, crispness there for one of another term? And how much has, have you just watched on video uh, Will's ability affected like Western Michigan and the way it played? Yeah. Um, you understand what I mean? His ability to run. Yes, yeah. and he is a factor in the run game. So him carrying out fakes or the ability to carry out fakes, I think people have to respect that because you can look at what he did at Kansas State and say, hey, this kid, when he has the ball in his hands, can do some different things. You know, And I think a lot of times there have been plays that we've called to see if Will can run the ball, but they've sat, in, sat on him, so then we, he hands the ball off. So I think he's made some good decisions from that standpoint. So um, we're pleased. But I don't think we're ever satisfied. I think we can be better in the run game. And I think that's what our goal is each week is can, can we be better this week coming up than we were the week before? And if so, how do we continue to grow as a group? You know, you, you hope that your worst game was your first game, you know, and that you continue to grow as the season goes along because you got that bank of experience that you can, you can fall back on to say, hey, what did we learn coming out of the Akron game that we took into the Western Michigan game? And did we get a little bit better on what we did in the run game? If the answer is yes, then, then you're moving in the right direction. Now, I don't know how Saturday plays out, you know, but are we going to be better in terms of running the football against Marshall than we were against Western Michigan? Then we're moving in the right direction, and that's, that's what our goal is every week. But, um, you know, I'm proud of what we're doing. I think we're pretty efficient right now. Um, we can be better. Um, you know, we had an 80-yarder call back. Um, you know, so some of the, you know, you know, making sure we have the hands on the, where they're supposed to be on the perimeter. Um, and then I think we've been really efficient without having the ball on the ground so far. So knock on wood, you know, we haven't turned the ball over in two games, but that's critical to our success here is making sure that we end the play, every single play that we get the ball handed to us, we end the play by handing it back to an official. So, Coach, thank you very much. Thanks, Sharon.